We're excited for our first speaker to have Dr. Stephen Brunton, um, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, in addition to all his work on data-driven dynamics that he'll talk about, to us about today, he's also very well known for his lectures and his books on dynamical systems. So um, they're really a beautiful set of lectures that are all up on, on YouTube. Um, so, um, you know, thanks for giving us to the community. Um, and so <clears throat> with that, um, I won't take up much of your time and I'll, I'll hand it over. So thanks for joining us and, and coming to tell us about your work. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation and also for the introduction. Um, so it's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully next time we will all be uh, in close physical proximity too, so we can have coffee together. Um, yeah, so this is a really exciting time to be a scientist and an engineer. Um, we have this kind of transformative uh, paradigm of machine learning or, or data-driven discovery that's changing how we do uh, almost everything. And so today I'm gonna to show you some of the work that my group is doing using machine learning for scientific discovery uh, for engineering systems. But I also wanna point out that although there are these tools that are kind of brand new and really changing everything, they're deeply rooted in optimization techniques that we've been using for decades, if not centuries. And so there's this kind of continuum of thought uh, that I wanna to, to take you through today. And uh, before starting, I want to acknowledge my many excellent co-authors, collaborators, uh, and colleagues in this work, and especially in the middle row, the fantastic postdocs and grad students who did most of the work I'm going to tell you about today. Um, so if I get a really hard question, I'm going to kick it to them. Um, and usually this is where I like to start out because, um, you know, depending on the audience, we might have, um, you know, engineers, dynamical systems people, machine learning people, computer scientists. And I wanna get everyone on the common footing early. So I view machine learning, uh, if I wanna pigeonhole or, or put an umbrella around machine learning, I would say that this is essentially building models from data using optimization and regression techniques. And again, that is a tradition that goes back decades, all the way back to Kalman in the 1950s and 60s, at least probably hundreds of years before we've been building models from data using optimization and regression. Think about the planetary motion of Tycho Brahe and Kepler and Galileo. And so again, that's not fundamentally new. These are tools that are building on the history of scientific discovery based on data and optimization and regression, but we have much, much better tools. We have faster computers, better models, uh, sharper applied math and statistics tools, and a lot more data. And so that's kind of why in the last 20 years, this has taken off uh, at such a rapid pace. And today I'm going to talk specifically about how machine learning can be used for dynamical systems modeling. Uh, these tasks in blue are the tasks I think about on a daily basis. And so I'm going to give you examples from fluid mechanics because that's kind of my passion uh, and the applied field of, of, uh, that I've chosen is fluid mechanics. But this also applies to neuroscience, epidemiology, climate science, pretty much any dynamical system that's high dimensional, non-linear, multi-scale that you want to control and that you have limited sensors and, uh, and actuators. That's the kind of system that these methods will apply for. And so our dynamical systems tasks in blue are things like dimensionality reduction. Out of, you know, a fluid flow might need a million or a billion degrees of freedom to represent in a computer. Your brain has a hundred billion neurons. How do you take that very high dimensional representation and distill out the key features or patterns or coherent structures that actually matter? That's the dimensionality reduction task. Then we might want to do reduced order modeling. We might want to understand how those patterns co-evolve in time. What's the physics? What's the mechanism of how those evolve? Uh, that's reduced order modeling. We might want to do sparse sensing. If we don't have full state measurements of our fluid flow over a Boeing wing, or you can't measure all of your 100 billion neurons, where would you place sensors to listen in an optimal way to estimate uh, what's happening in that system? And then, of course, all of this kind of, for me at least, culminates in estimation and control. Those are kind of my high-level goals. And what I want to point out is that every single task in blue is a really, really hard optimization problem. They are, generally speaking, uh, non-convex high-dimensional optimization problems because the physics we're dealing with is high-dimensional and non-linear and multi-scale. 
Okay, and those are th those those optimization problems in pink are exactly the kinds of problems machine learning is getting really really good at. Okay, so that's just to kind of level set for everybody uh, to be on the same page. We're going to be trying to solve these tasks in blue. Uh, they're really hard optimization problems. The challenges are given in pink, and machine learning is getting really really good at solving these kinds of optimizations with data. Okay. Now, why do we believe we can do this? Why do we think we can do dimensionality reduction and control of really, really complex fluid flows? And the reason is, is because patterns exist in your data. This is why we believe we can uh, achieve these tasks in our dynamical systems. And it's also why we believe we can use machine learning. Machine learning is predicated on the existence of patterns in your data that are actionable, that you can use and exploit to make good decisions. So this flow over Guadalupe Island, even though this is probably beyond our ability as humans to simulate at full detail and full resolution, you can see the emergence of this very clear dominant pattern that could be modeled with a differential equation. Uh, and actually, if you're interested in this, we wrote a review paper. This was led by Sam Tyra from UCLA, kind of exploring how to extract these patterns and modal decompositions for complex fluid flows. Okay, so this is how I organize the work that goes on in my lab uh, in this kind of generalized control diagram where everything I care about in the world is a dynamical system in blue. So up in this blue box, that's where my fluid flow is. That's where the neuroscience, your brain lives there. Epidemiology, diseases spreading across um, a continent is a dynamical system. And we want to model and control those systems. So probably about half of what my lab does is apply machine learning techniques directly to learn models of these dynamical systems from data. And we're gonna, this is what I'm gonna talk about today is this block here. And we really put a premium on models that are interpretable and generalizable, that can be communicated uh, and analyzed by humans and that will work beyond where they were trained. So that's what I'm gonna talk about almost exclusively today. Another big part of my lab is directly developing control laws with machine learning. So in bypassing modeling and going directly to learning controllers through trial and error, through experience. Um, this is very much biologically inspired, and this includes things like reinforcement learning, genetic programming, things like that. And then the third kind of major um, part of my lab is learning efficient sensor and actuator locations for optimal estimation and control of these complex systems. And again, uh, this is this is biologically inspired work. Actually, I work on this with my wife, um, my, my spouse, Bing Brunton. She's a neuroscientist. And so together we think about how uh, animals like these, this flying insect, this moth, uses strain sensitive neurons on their wings to inform their flight control decisions. This is really fascinating work. Um, it turns out that every flying insect has on the order of 10 to 100 strain sensitive neurons on their wings. And they can react to gusts in the wind faster than that sensor information goes to the brain and back to the muscles. Which means this is proof by existence that they're doing local computations in their sensors and in their shoulder muscles. And this is the kind of capability we as engineers would want to have this kind of uh, distributed local sensing and actuation and computation. And I'm just going to give a teaser because I'm not going to talk about this today, but just a teaser that the same mathematical architecture you can use to discover and understand sensing on insect wings, you can use to help uh, aircraft manufacturers make and assemble and design their wings. And so this is a really cool uh, translational science story. If you're interested, I, I encourage you to read this paper by Krithika Manahar, where essentially we use this sparse sensor technology to dramatically streamline uh, a manufacturing process at Boeing to uh, when they're assembling their wings. And currently this technology is in production right now on the 787, 777X and 737 MAX, estimated savings in the hundreds of millions of dollars, which is crazy. Like you almost never think that your applied math algorithm is actually gonna be in a factory someday. <laughs> Okay, so that was just a teaser, but today I'm going to talk almost exclusively about building interpretable, generalizable physics models from data, okay? And this is really kind of a passion of my group, and there's really exciting things happening every day in the field uh, in, this, in this topic of modeling dynamics. So I'm going to start off with a vignette um, or a, a story about this, um, this great work by Jared Callahan, who's my, my PhD student, 
on automating this process of dominant balance uh, approximation. And so dominant balance is actually for a lot of the young people in the audience, you might have never heard of dominant balance, but it's really, really important. It is the cornerstone of asymptotic analysis. And this is where most applied math departments in the United States uh, were born, actually. So a lot of applied math departments in the US were born out of aerospace engineering departments because the asymptotic analysis, the dominant balance analysis became so mathematically involved, they needed a whole department uh, to solve these problems. This is in the 1950s before computers. And so the idea is if you have a really complicated uh, physical equation like the Navier-Stokes fluid flow equations, which in three dimensions has a lot of terms, like you know more than 50 terms, what you could do is make physical arguments that in certain regions of space and time, some of those terms of the equations are unimportant, nearly zero, and can be neglected, while other terms in the equation are going to be large and active and in a dominant balance with each other. They're balancing the equation. And so what we wanted to do was see if we can use machine learning techniques to automate this procedure of finding these dominant balance regimes in, in physical systems. So we're going to warm up on this uh, boundary layer. This is the Johns Hopkins Turbulent uh, Boundary Layer Dataset open source, so you can download this and try it yourself. The first thing you would do with a boundary layer problem like this, or like a fluid flow, is you might take a two-dimensional slice in the midplane and average in time to get the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. And this equation has six terms. This is kind of a warm up to explore dominant balance. There's six terms. And the hypothesis is that in certain regions of space, some of these terms will be active and balancing while others will be approximately zero. And so what Jared realized is you can actually compute each of these terms for every point in space. So for example, this is the U bar U bar sub X where subscript denotes partial derivative. Uh, I think here blue is positive and red is negative. And you can do this for all six terms in the equation. You can get six fields, spatial fields, one for each term in the equation. And already you can see that there are certain regions where some of the terms are, are large and balancing, while others are zero or approximately zero, uh, denoted by black. And so what you can do is for every point in space, there are six unique numbers specifying that point given by these six terms of the equation. So every spatial point has six numbers, and you can plot all of those spatial points in the six dimensional equation space, where each axis is a term of the equation. So this is, um, this is the data represented in equation space. These are two dimensional slices. And every white point is, an, is a point in space corresponding to my boundary layer. So already you can see that the data lives apparently approximately in subspaces. There appear to be these subspaces that, uh, that the data lives on. And so what Jared did was applied relatively simple clustering. This is a Gaussian mixture model to segment the data up into clusters. And then for each cluster, for the red, the purple, the orange, and so on, he applied a sparse subspace identification tool to try to model. So if we look at the red cluster, what he's going to try to do is find a subspace that describes most of the variance with as many zero components as possible. Same with blue, purple, green, and so on. And so in doing so, you can see that each of these clusters is described by a subset of the physics of the original full equation. So the red uh, term, the red equations only need two terms, the blue only needs another two terms, and so on. And because every point uh, in this scatter plot corresponds to a, a point in space, you can replot these regions back in the boundary layer. So on the bottom, you can see my boundary layer color coded by what subset of the physics is active in those regions. And this recapitulates 100 years of boundary layer theory. This is completely automated from, from data. You learn that there is a viscous sublayer, an inertial sublayer, a transitional region, and so on and so forth, purely by just looking at what terms are large and active in what regions of space. Very cool idea. One of the things I'm excited about is that you can apply this. Any system you have where you can compute derivatives and you have data, and you have some idea of what the equations are, you can start to compute these subspaces and color code your, your space time diagrams by what dominant physics is active. So if we only did this to rediscover the boundary layer, that would, that would be kind of cute, uh, but not really useful. So since then, we have applied this to a lot of other systems where we didn't necessarily know the answer. 
uh, like the super continuum uh, high energy laser problem, where we essentially learned where the nonlinearities are localized and what the mechanisms are driving these, uh, these, these lasers. We've applied this to geophysical flows like the Gulf of Mexico to find different uh, kind of balance laws where different weather uh, patterns would be observed, kind of different local physics. And we're also applying this to neuroscience systems, uh, both single neurons, but also um, kind of brain imaging, spatial temporal brain imaging. And again, in all of these cases, if you have data that is um, that you can, you know, approximate derivatives in terms of the equation, you can compute these subspace regions and color code your, your regions of space. So these are highly interpretable because a human can understand that these different colored regions correspond to different subsets of the equations. You can analyze these, you can do matched asymptotics, you can do all of the things that applied math departments have been doing for the last 70 years. Um, that, that I think is kind of exciting. So this is, uh, you know, fresh off the presses and I, I, you know, highly encourage people to download the code and try it out if you have spatial temporal data, it's really cool. Okay, for the, the second half of the talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We're still going to be talking about building interpretable models of dynamical systems. But now we're going to be talking about building kind of reduced order models uh, for complex systems like this. So this is a fluid flow in the wake of a transportation vehicle. And um, this is a real experimental data from my colleagues uh, in Germany, Richard Zeman at TU Braunschweig. And what we want is a low order model of the form x dot equals f of x, where x is a minimal state, it's a low dimensional state with only a few variables that describes the dominant coherent patterns observed in the data. And f of x is the simplest dynamical system that describes how those patterns co-evolve. And these kinds of models will be very useful for understanding, for prediction, estimation, and control, and, and also for design of these systems. And again, if you're not interested in fluids, that's totally fine. You can replace this with data from a brain or, you know, data from a disease spreading across a continent or whatever high dimensional dynamical system you're interested in. I'm guessing reduced order models would still be useful for you. Okay, before I show you the results of how we actually do this, I'm going to give you a little bit of our philosophy on what kinds of models we want as engineers and scientists. And I can't emphasize this enough. This might be the most important thing I'm going to tell you today um, is just kind of this uh, connecting what we do today with machine learning with the centuries or millennia old pursuits in scientific uh, discovery. So we need machine learning models. First of all, we need machine learning models. Most of the systems we care about are too complicated to write down the physics by hand. So we need machine learning models for the brain, for turbulence, for diseases. That's a given. But we need machine learning models that are interpretable and generalizable. If you're going to get on an airplane that was designed using machine learning, if you're going to get in a car with an autopilot that is designed using machine learning, it better be interpretable and generalizable. Okay, and instead of defining what these mean, I'm going to give you my favorite example. My favorite interpretable generalizable model is Newton's second law, F equals MA. It's clearly interpretable. It's very simple. It has three terms, F, M, and A. They have units. You can write this equation down for a particular system of interest. You can go to the coffee shop and analyze and discuss uh, this equation. Okay, so it's interpretable. Uh, you can communicate to other humans what it means. And it's highly generalizable in the sense that Newton's law can be learned from apples falling on Earth, at least that's the, the, the story, and it's still true when we land humans on the moon. That is an incredible power of generalization, and that's the kind of model we would love our machine learning models to be returning, models that are interpretable and generalizable. Now, we use lots of neural networks. Neural networks are incredibly powerful, um, arbitrary function approximators, and we should definitely use the most powerful tools at our disposal. But not all machine learning is neural networks, and not every model should be a, an end-to-end -end neural network. So, for example, I can take videos of apples falling. If I had 5,000 of these videos, I could train a neural network to generate brand new videos of new apples falling that you've never seen before that would fool all of us in the audience. But that machine learned model, that neural network that generates movies of apples is not going to be useful when we land humans on, the, on Mars. Okay, we need something more like F equals MA for lots of engineering. And this is not just F equals MA. This has been a principle 
from Aristotle to Einstein for, for 2000 years, this has been the principle that we have used as the gold standard for what is known as physics. Physics are the bits of the model that generalize beyond where you trained them. And that is generally recognized as the parts of the model that are as simple as possible, but no simpler. That principle of parsimony is often how we find the generalizable physics uh, underlying your data. Okay, and that's going to be a common theme for us. That's a common theme in my lab. When we try to build machine learning models, we want our models to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that really is in contrast to these over-parameterized neural network models that are great at fitting functions, but they're not as simple as possible, but no simpler. And so the tools we have at our disposal, uh, kind of mathematical tools today, and optimization tools, are low dimensionality and sparsity. We want our model to be low dimensional. If we have really high dimensional data, we want to distill it down to the fewest patterns needed to describe it. And we want that differential equation that describes how they evolve to be as sparse as possible, to have as few terms in the equation as possible. And so this is the picture that we often think about, um, is this kind of deep autoencoder neural network where we have dynamics in the middle. So the idea is that we often need to learn a coordinate transformation phi from our high dimensional space into a latent space Z, a low dimensional space, where we can then get sparse kind of parsimonious dynamical systems Z dot equals F of Z. And if we can do this, then we have found the coordinates and the dynamics of our complex system. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Um, if you fast forward from F equals MA a couple of hundred years, we have this uh, Lorentz 1963 model. And this Lorentz 1963 model is designed to kind of model the chaotic thermal conduction observed in, in uh, terrestrial weather. And it has exactly the characteristics that we pointed out that we want earlier. It's low dimensional. It's in terms of three variables, X, Y, and Z, which are the amplitudes of three spatial nodes. And it's sparse. Out of all of the possible differential equations that could describe x dot, y dot, and z dot, this has very few terms. It has seven terms, and five of them are linear. It's about as simple as it can get. And so that's the kind of model we want our machine learning models to reproduce. And so what I'm going to show you now is our procedure for essentially automating this type of modeling of complex systems, kind of the Lorentz type modeling uh, of complex systems. So we call our technique CINDY, the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. And I'm actually going to illustrate it on the Lorentz system, and then I'm going to show you some more sophisticated examples. So what we're going to do is pretend that we have data from, uh, from the Lorentz system, but we only measure x, y, and z, and we don't know what the equations are. So we measure x, y, and z, and we assume we can compute derivatives. By far the simplest model you could write down would be a linear model. This is you know, a little three by three A matrix. This is what the dynamic mode decomposition does. But we know that a little three by three A matrix is not gonna be rich enough to describe the chaotic dynamics observed in the data. You know, Multiple fixed points, unstable periodic orbits, and chaos. So instead what we do in CINDY is we augment our right-hand side to include more candidate terms that could describe the dynamics. In this case, we include higher order polynomials, x squared, xy, y squared, and so on up to fifth order. Now, very important point, we're not limited to polynomials. You could have sines and cosines, Bessel's functions, any functions you can dream up, you can put in this library. I'm just using polynomials because they're simple and you can tailor expand things. And so now the goal is to find the fewest terms in this candidate library that add up to equal x dot that add up to equal y dot, and that add up to equal z dot, the observed data. Now, 20 years ago, this sparse regression problem would have been a combinatorially hard, NP-hard problem. Now, there are dozens of commodity algorithms to solve this problem. We cooked up our own uh, sparse optimization algorithm for this. It's easy to do now. And when you apply that sparse regression, when you find the fewest terms needed, remember, the simplest model but no simpler, what you find is the structure and parameters of the actual nonlinear dynamical system that generated the data. So this is real nonlinear system identification. Um, okay, good. And this is a warm-up problem. Of course, we knew the answer. You know, we simulated it from the equations. This is just a warm-up to show it's possible. If you're interested in trying this, um, we have a pretty well-maintained open source code, PyCindy. Um, it's professionally developed by, by current and former lab members and the community, and you can download this and try this yourself. 
Okay, so you can discover ordinary differential equations from data. It turns out you can also discover partial differential equations. This is pretty cool. This is work by Sam Rudy when he was a PhD student with Nathan Kutz and myself, where what he did was he took spatial temporal data uh, from this flow past a cylinder, this, this canonical fluid flow. And what he did was build the same type of Cindy library but now the, the candidate terms that could describe the dynamics include partial derivatives and nonlinear cross terms. So here again, subscript denotes partial derivative. Omega sub x is partial omega partial x. And when you apply the sparse regression technique, you learn that the sparsest, the, the simplest dynamics that's consistent with the data is this term uh, in the block marked D. And that equation is exactly the same as the Navier Stokes equation. It's just kind of written out in components with the coefficients matching the true coefficients to within 1%. So this is really remarkable. From data alone, we can learn that the Navier Stokes equation is the most consistent model with that data. Now, it's interesting. Again, those of you in the audience should be thinking to yourselves, well, that's cute, but we kind of already knew the answer. Like clearly you simulated that, that fluid flow with the Navier-Stokes equations. So, you know, we knew the answer to begin with. And that's certainly true. I think it's important when you are developing new technology and machine learning to apply it to systems where you know the answer to see what works and what doesn't, what breaks, how it breaks, when it works, things like that. Since this paper, our lab and, and groups across the world have applied this to new systems where we don't know the answer. Plasma systems, active matter systems, uh, neuroscience systems, epidemiological systems, where there is not an agreed upon governing partial differential equation. And in those cases, we're starting to get PDEs that have never been written down before that actually describe the data very, very well with a very simple set of physics. And these actually drive hypotheses. If you have an equation with some terms that are hypothesized by these models, you can then do experiments to test if those terms are actually valid or not when you change parameters in your experiments or simulations. So our colleagues are learning new plasma models that have never been written down before that are more sophisticated than MHD. And that's, I think, really, really neat. Um, because spatial temporal data is so rich, this is just a sub point, you can get away with massively subsampling your data, and there's still typically enough data uh, to identify these models. Okay, good. So um, what we've talked about so far in Cindy is that you can learn dynamics from data. So this is kind of a paradigm for learning interpretable, generalizable dynamics from data. They're interpretable because they're sparse. They're generalizable because, again, you're modeling with as simple a model as possible, but no simpler. And so typically you end up learning the correct form of the equations that generalizes to new scenarios. Uh, and those can be ordinary or partial differential equations. So again, for the Lorentz system, we learned, you know, systems like the Lorentz equations. For fluid flows, we learned things like the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, you can also do a third path, which I think is really exciting, which is if you have this fluid flow, I might not want a, a PDE. I might want something more like the Lorentz equations. And so what I can do is I can decompose my fluid flow into a set of modes, and I can model the amplitude of those modes x, y, and z. I can get a three-dimensional model in terms of the amplitudes, again, learned directly from data with Cindy. So that's what I'm going to show you now is that third row of kind of getting reduced order models using this technique. So uh, the flow past a cylinder is always our warm-up problem in fluids um, because we really understand a lot about it. It's canonically, you know, well studied. And so that's going to be, again, our, our warm-up problem. And 20 years ago, Barrett Nowak and friends showed us that this is a good coordinate system to represent our cylinder flow in. If you take that cylinder flow and you write it in terms of POD1, POD2, and a shift mode, that would be X, Y, and Z then you can write down a really nice differential equation that describes the evolution of those mode amplitudes in time. And this does a really, really good job of capturing the essential physics of the problem. So we thought it would be interesting to take this data and feed it directly into Cindy. So um, the equation in blue here that Bernd Nowak wrote down is what's called a, an intrusive reduced order model. 
It means that you need to have a working numerical simulation of the Navier-Stokes equations where you can get inside the code and evaluate different terms of the equations. It's very human intensive. Typically, this takes like a grad student year to build these models for a new system. And so our method is non-intrusive. We don't need a working code. We just need the data and we need this coordinate system. So if I measure X, Y, and Z, you can feed that into Cindy and you can learn these models in blue with regression alone that capture the essential physics of the system. So this was really exciting for us. This was the first example where we thought, you know, this might actually really be a useful tool um, for reduced order modeling to go beyond kind of the state of the art. And within a couple of weeks of putting this paper on the archive, uh, I got an email from John Christophe Loiseau. Uh, he was at KTH at the time. Now he's at uh, Ensem in Paris. And he had some really, really cool innovations that immediately improved our Cindy algorithm for physical systems. And I think this is super exciting for this community, for the kind of physics informed machine learning community, because this is a great example of how you can incorporate partially known physics into these model discovery machine learning algorithms. And there's a lot of ways of doing this, but this is probably my favorite way. So what JC realized is that when I was doing my Cindy models for the flow, I basically put in as little information as possible. I used a library of quadratic nonlinearities, and that's it. But he said, you know, we actually know a ton about these fluid flow systems. We might not know what the exact differential equation is going to look like, but we know that the system conserves energy because it's, in, because it's an incompressible fluid. And we know specifically that all models of incompressible fluids that are energy conserving have a skew symmetry in the quadratic terms, and that's how they conserve energy. And so with a very simple modification to our algorithm, essentially adding one or two more lines of code, JC was able to enforce these equality constraints that made it so by construction, our models were skew symmetric and enforced uh, energy conservation. And that's a really, really clever way of baking in partial knowledge of the physics, like a symmetry or an invariance or a conservation law into this model discovery procedure. Immediately, we get more stable models with less data. That's a huge benefit too. You can get away with less data when you enforce these symmetries and conservations. The second innovation JC added, which I think is really cool, um, and this is maybe more of a physicist's um, innovation, is that we know the Navier-Stokes equations have quadratic nonlinearities, and so that's what I decided to model. But JC pointed out that if you include higher order terms, cubic, quintic, septic, nonic, third, fifth, seventh, ninth order terms, you can account for neglected low energy model uh, modes in the model that you've truncated but they have a dynamic effect on the variables you care about on X, Y, and Z. And this is related to the energy cascade uh, in fluid flow systems. And essentially what this allows you to do with Cindy is develop a rudimentary closure law um, for, for these laminar systems. So since then, our colleagues have used Cindy to actually build closure models for, uh, for turbulent systems, which is really exciting. So let's see how it works on some prediction problems. So these are two canonical fluid flows, the cavity flow and the cylinder. And in the right column, you'll see this white curve, A delta. A delta is basically the drag. It's some quantity we really care about as engineers and we wanna model accurately as it evolves in time. The yellow and blue curves are the previous industry best POD Galerkin models. These are kind of like those models um, Barrett Noack developed in, in the early 2000s. And you'll see that they're qualitatively okay, but quantitatively they're not very accurate. They have massive overshoot, uh, steady state error, and they, they have the wrong rise time. The, the instability growth is, is incorrect. But when we use JC's constrained or cubic Cindy models, we get models that are quantitatively almost perfect, in almost perfect agreement with the actual uh, observed nonlinear drag evolution. And that's really cool. You get more accurate models because the regression has some wiggle room to kind of fudge the numbers to fit the data better. But what's even cooler about this is that these Cindy models, again, are sparse by construction. There's only a few terms in the model. So you can go and write the model down, take it you know, on a napkin, take it to a coffee shop in Paris and analyze and play with it. And that's, that's what JC did. And this is the model he came up with for the cylinder. So this model in blue here is the actual model used to get that almost perfect agreement in Cindy with the cylinder flow. 
And it basically says that the model is a nonlinear spring mass damper. That's what the cylinder flow is. And that's the simplest and most accurate model that I, to my knowledge has ever been written down for this flow, which is, which is really saying something. This is the most analyzed flow in all of fluid dynamics. And JC wrote down an equation that's never been written down before that is simpler and more accurate because he was able to do that with these interpretable models. Another kind of cool thing you can do uh, with this sparse modeling procedure is if you don't have access to the wake measurements, if you don't have access to the full spatial temporal data, maybe you um, only have access to lift and drag measurements on the surface of these three cylinders. That's much more realistic for Boeing and Airbus, where they might only measure forces on their wings. You can actually build these um, sparse models directly on those uh, lift and drag coordinates which I think is kind of a, a neat thing you can demonstrate. And this actually gets around one of the most fundamental issues in reduced order modeling, which is if I change my wing geometry, or if I pitch or plunge my wing, if I move my wing, uh, or if I change the flow conditions, if I speed up or slow down, all of those things break the previous pod Galerkin models. But if you model based on intrinsic coordinates like force measurements uh, or pressure measurements on the surface of these objects, then you can actually build these models um, across those conditions. So this is becoming a pretty powerful engineering tool for companies like Boeing and Airbus to model things like flutter, instability, uh, and things like that. Okay, so that was the big picture of modeling things with Cindy. Um, and I'm just going to throw up kind of a teaser, maybe this is for the question and answer. I'm not going to go through all of these vignettes, but we have applied this to a ton of complex systems in plasma dynamics, you know, fusion reactors, electroconvection, uh, turbulent wake measurements. There's a lot of examples. If you're curious, I can go and kind of uh, walk through specifics here. And in all of these cases, what we've been trying to do is develop models of the form x dot equals f of x, where x is a low dimensional state, and f of x is as sparse as possible. And that's how we promote models that are uh, parsimonious, kind of this, this Einstein principle of, of the simplest model, model but no simpler. Uh, we promote that by sparsity and low dimensionality. Now, in all of these cases, what I've shown you so far is assuming that we had the right coordinate system x. So in the Lorentz case, we assumed we measured x, y, and z. In the flow past a cylinder, we use the coordinates that Barrett Noack told us were good coordinates, x, y, and z. But in lots of systems of interest like neuroscience or epidemiology, we don't know what the right low dimensional coordinate system is. So that's the last thing I'm going to tell you about before the question and answer period, is kind of how we discover coordinates for these dynamical systems identification tools. And I really, really like this picture. This has become kind of a standard, standard picture uh, for my group, um, Nathan Kutz and I collaborate a lot, um, and this is a picture we show our, our students and postdocs to kind of uh, build these methods. The idea is you have high dimensional data in X, and you're trying to learn a low dimensional set of kind of essential features in this latent space Z. And this autoencoder network is a really good picture for how we want to do this. So if you used this autoencoder network, what you're trying to do is choke down to a latent space so that you can still reconstruct as much of the information about X as possible. And if this was a linear shallow autoencoder, it would essentially recover the singular value decomposition or the principal components analysis. But if you allow yourself to have a deep multi-layer architecture with nonlinear activation functions, you can get even better coordinate uh, discovery. Even, you know, you can discover manifolds that describe your data instead of subspaces. And so what we do is we combine this power of deep neural network autoencoders with learning dynamics in that latent space, with trying to find these sparse Cindy models in the latent space. Now, I want to again point out that oftentimes, if we just measured X, that that's the wrong coordinate system, and there's not going to be sparse models in X. So you need to learn these latent spaces Z. And the picture I have in my mind for this is actually, again, going back to classical, uh, kind of classical scientific discovery. You know, this is how the night sky looks to humans on Earth. We're the blue dot in the middle. And when we look up at night for, for you know, all of human history, from, from the first 
humans looking up at the sky, this is essentially what we see. The stars are simple, but the planets do crazy things. The planets, you know, sometimes Mars turns around in its orbit and goes the wrong direction, goes in retrograde. It's very hard to come up with F equals MA when Earth is the center of the universe. And so if you apply a simple coordinate transformation to put the sun at the center of our solar system, now it's possible to learn the parsimonious kind of dynamical system F equals MA. And this is a really kind of simple uh, illustrative example that if you're in the wrong coordinate system, the physics is super complicated. You, it's hard to get the parsimonious explanation, but if you're in the right coordinate system, everything falls into place. Okay, and that's kind of our idea for, for a lot of the combination of autoencoder networks with these sparse modeling techniques. And this is what Kathleen Champion worked on when she was a PhD student with Nathan and me, was to essentially learn good coordinate system Z with autoencoders so that you can get a sparse Cindy model, a sparse interpretable model in that latent space Z. It turns out this is a very difficult optimization problem. It's stiff, it's challenging, you need extra loss terms, custom loss terms in your, um, in your autoencoder, but it is fundamentally possible to learn these good coordinate systems. For example, if you had video, like GoPro footage of a pendulum, you can essentially learn that there is a coordinate system theta, theta dot, and that the dynamics are theta double dot equals sine of theta. Okay, that's the kind of thing that Kathleen's Cindy autoencoder can learn. It's not easy, but it is mathematically possible. And this gives you an architecture for simultaneously finding those coordinates and the dynamics. Now, what's really cool is that you can add additional constraints on those dynamics F. I could add symmetry constraints or conservation constraints. Um, I could add those skew symmetry constraints that JC pointed out. But what we could do is go even further and say that in the dynamics in the latent space, maybe instead of sparse, we actually want the dynamics to be linear, which is a lot to ask for. And so it is technically possible in many dynamical systems to find a coordinate system that actually linearizes your dynamics. This is related to Koopman operator theory. And Bethany Lush, when she was a postdoc with Nathan and me, essentially developed this Koopman autoencoder network that for very, very complex systems will find a linearizing coordinate transformation uh, where your dynamics appear linear. And in that latent space, you can do optimal linear estimation, prediction, and control, again, because the, the system is linear. If you're interested in that, this is again just a teaser. Uh, we have this whole review paper. Um, it's a pretty massive, massive paper. It's like 110 pages that goes all into this Koopman theory of when these coordinate transformations exist, how you might discover them, uh, and how neural networks and universal function approximation uh, fits in. Okay, so again, I could give you lots of examples of applying this to complex fluid flows. Um, we've applied this to fusion reactor data simulations. We've applied this to electroconvection, uh, to turbulence experiments, to cavity flows and things like that. Maybe instead of going through all of those examples, I'll save those for the question and answer. And I'll just summarize at a very high level here that the goal for reduced order modeling, for understanding, for uh, control, for design of engineering systems is interpretable and generalizable dynamical systems models. And the way that we achieve those models is by modeling things like this x dot equals f of x, where x is the minimal state needed to describe the system, the simplest state but no simpler, and the dynamics f are as sparse as possible to describe the evolving dynamics. Again, as sparse as possible, but no sparser. And that's going back to that principle of parsimony, which has been the gold standard of getting generalizable physics models for you know, over 2000 years. Okay, with that, I'd be happy uh, to take questions. Thank you all so much for your attention. Um, and yeah, I think we have 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so let's let's get started with questions. Um, there are three in the in the um, Q and A. So um, the first one is, uh, what exactly is the ML algorithm that you use in Cindy? Can you explain in a little bit more detail? Sorry, the question was, what is the the core algorithm used in Cindy? Yeah, exact ML algorithm. 
Good. Yeah, so so Cindy, okay, I have a pretty broad definition of, of what I consider as machine learning. So again, remember, my definition of machine learning is building models from data with optimization and regression. And so the Cindy algorithm is actually quite simple. What we do um, is we build a library. And there's a lot of ways we could build that library. We could use genetic programming. You could write down polynomials. There's, there's, you know, you could evolve these libraries. Lots of ways of writing that down. And essentially, what we're doing is using sparse uh, optimization to find the fewest columns of theta that equals x dot y dot and z dot. And so the sparse optimization algorithm that we use is a custom algorithm based on sequential thresholded least squares. We first do a least squares regression to find this C matrix, but least squares is going to give all of the coefficients being non-zero, but some of them will be small. So we threshold the small ones and we do another least squares onto the remaining coefficients. Now some of those are going to be small and we iterate this process until it converges and what's left is this kind of skeletal structure of what terms are remaining in the model. Now, again, you can enforce extra terms in the loss function. You can use different custom optimization algorithms, and this is inherently pinned to data. So that fits inside the kind of machine learning paradigm of, you know, there is a, a model architecture, this generalized linear model. There is a loss function. We're trying to minimize the model fit and the L0 norm of Xi. And you pick an optimization algorithm to minimize that loss function over the data within that architecture, within those three parameters. Now, um, when you attach this into that, uh, when you embed this into that, that kind of Cindy autoencoder framework, um, now you're using more kind of classical machine learning techniques like deep autoencoders and multi-layer neural networks and things like that. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Um, sure. So thanks uh, for the very exciting talk. So regarding this sparse regression that you mentioned, can you comment on the uniqueness of the solution that you get? Is uh, there might uh, is that the case that you might get multiple systems, multiple coefficients that describe the same data? And how do you? Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic uh, point. And there's actually a, there's a lot of directions to go in, to, in answering this question. And I think we've actually we've written multiple follow up papers directly just on that question because it's such a good question. Um, so let me think about how to answer it. The, the first the first answer is. Um, Okay, so the first answer is that if my data, if my training data is not rich enough, then there could be multiple models in that library theta that are equally consistent with the training data. The example I like to give is if I have data that is just on a, a limit cycle, just data that's going around in a circle in X and Y, I could write down a dozen models that give limit cycle data. It could be a linear oscillator. It could be a cubic hop bifurcation model. There's many, many models that are consistent. And that will actually correspond to a theta matrix that is ill-conditioned, that is singular. Um, so the condition number of theta tells you if there are multiple subspaces that are kind of um, equally valid, if there's some kind of uh, like null space where you know, there, there's multiple solutions that are valid and consistent with that data. So the first thing we recommend when doing Cindy is to make sure you have a rich enough training data so that the theta matrix becomes better and better conditioned because that will, will disambiguate those, those different models. For the limit cycle data, that corresponds to measuring, uh, you know, maybe I'm at one radius, I'll need to sample at another radius. And if my dynamics are linear, then it's a linear oscillator. But if they're nonlinear, then I can get, you know, the cubic terms from the, the double amplitude uh, initial conditions. So looking at the condition number of theta is really critical and making sure that you're sampling your system in a rich way off the attractor, getting transients, uh, things like that. Which is related to per probably persistence of excitation. Which... It's exactly. It's related to that. Um, it's related to active learning. Um, so there's a, a ton of interesting directions to take that in. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is when you solve the sparse regression problem, there is usually a hyperparameter that tells you how much you care about sparsity and how much you care about accuracy. And so by sweeping through that parameter, you can actually get a family of models that are less complex, um, but less accurate to more complex and more accurate. And so you can actually get a hierarchy of models that do different fidelity descriptions of the data. And in this case, you know, there's really one model that perfectly matches the data. 
But in the example I showed you with, you know, plasma physics, where we don't really know the true answer, you might actually want that, that hierarchy or that family of multi-fidelity models that kind of do different jobs with different fidelities. Um, so that's kind of the other angle of, uh, of that problem of, of non-uniqueness. Great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just a, a quick um, question while we're on that topic. So um, a lot of that has to do with how well right, a model mismatch or a model match between the terms that you pick to populate this dictionary and the actual dynamics. So if you misspecify the dictionary, right? So if you picked only polynomials, but it was a sine or cosine, right? the right answer is to build the Taylor series for a sine or cosine, but that takes infinite terms. Right. Um, so how do you ensure that, you know, for unknown dynamics that you're including kind of the most relevant? Yeah, great, 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 great question. Um, so this, this is good. This is, these are some of the best uh, and most common questions in Cindy. Um, there, there's a lot of answers for this actually too. So polynomial, the first answer is, uh, to say that polynomials have been shockingly good. We have been surprised at how good polynomials are, even when we know that they're not the right basis. Again, because of Taylor series approximations, like they tend to, and this goes back to that dominant physics explanation that even when you have, you know, nasty nonlinearities, oftentimes the dominant balance is, you know, quadratic or cubic or quartic, things like that. Um, and that's time and time again, been observed in systems like the Stuart Landau oscillator and, and things like that. Now, for fluid flow systems, for plasma systems, we actually are really, really fortunate. For spatial temporal systems governed by convection, the nonlinearity is quadratic. And, and so what we expect to get is polynomial models, actually. Like when you Galerkin project, you get polynomial models. And so polynomial models are really good for systems modeling fluid flows, like the Lorentz system, like my fluid flow past a cylinder. So at least in my field, we kind of get an easy pass that polynomials are great for fluids. Not true for neuroscience, not true for epidemiology necessarily, not true for human metabolic networks. And so in those systems, what we recommend, there, there's two big recommendations. One is if you have partial knowledge of your physics, like, let's say I'm dealing with a quantum mechanics system. I know for quantum mechanics systems that I'm dealing with Schrodinger equation physics. So I can put terms like I would see in the Schrodinger equation into this library. Instead of polynomials, I will have polynomials in, you know, the modulus of X, you know, the absolute value of X times X squared, things like that. So I can custom build my library for quantum optic systems. When I'm dealing with human metabolic networks, I know that chemical kinetics have rational functions, you know, x dot equals x over one minus x. This is, um, Neil Mangan did some really great work generalizing Cindy to rational function libraries, and she can model chemical kinetics, you know, really, really well with those types of libraries. Um, when I'm dealing with other types of systems that I know the nonlinearity, I use those to custom build data. So, so we're not stuck with polynomials. But then the second piece of this, and, and I actually think this is an answer I like better personally because I come from dynamical systems is most systems, even if you have a really nasty nonlinearity, are a small coordinate transformation away from a normal form where the dynamics really are described by relatively simple polynomials, sparse polynomial models, cubic, quintic, quadratic. Um, you know, this is the core theory from like the 1970s, 1980s dynamical system that these relatively simple coordinate transformations can kill terms and make your really nasty dynamics look like sparse polynomials in normal form. And so that's kind of the other side of this is that you could also just apply coordinate transformations and then polynomials might actually work again. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. It's muted. Sorry. Uh, great. Thank you. So going back um, just to follow up uh, or to just uh, finish off some of these questions in the chat. Um, does Sydney, uh, Sydney work for a turbulent flow of high Reynolds number? Yeah, great question. Um, and this is one of those, you know, Sydney has been such a fun research avenue for us, partly because 
you know, it was kind of a cute idea at first. We were like, oh, look, you could do nonlinear system ID. Like I've always wanted to do that, but we never thought it would apply to turbulent fluid flows, right? Like if you had asked me three years ago, I'd say, you know, probably not. There's probably other things you need to do with turbulent fluid flows. In the meantime, we've actually found some pretty powerful ways of applying this to turbulence. One of them is a generalization where you can build stochastic differential equation models like these Langevin equations. So you can build a Cindy model for X, where X are the dominant turbulent coherent structures, but also identify a model for the correlated noise forcing sigma X WT for the, all of the truncated turbulence models. Uh, and you know, it's a slightly more complicated procedure, but it's, it's relatively similar to Cindy. And we've applied this to turbulent wake experiments uh, from actual, you know, very, very high Reynolds number turbulence experiments from uh, George Regas's lab at Imperial College. You know, Reynolds number almost a million or at, at a million. So really, really turbulent uh, stuff. This paper, um, you know, the, the, the turbulent wake paper is in revision right now, but hopefully will appear soon. Um, the other angle that has allowed us a lot of traction on, on really high Reynolds number problems is again, going back to these auto encoder networks. Um, so this is a system where we need 50 or 100 POD modes. It's too big to do Cindy on. But by using some custom knowledge of the physics, we can use these kind of nonlinear autoencoder embeddings to find driving nonlinear model uh, modes that drive the system. And I'm just gonna give the punchline. You can basically build a model in two variables, two complex variables, two Stuart Landau equations and then get all of the nonlinear crosstalk and frequency modulation and you know, all of the triadic interactions by using this autoencoder network. So again, two or three years ago, I'd say, no, it's not possible. But now you know, we actually have some tools that are really making traction with turbulence. And not just in my lab, um, great work by Sarah Beetham and Jesse Capasalatro uh, from Michigan applying Cindy to develop RAND's closure models. And also Schmelzer has developed some cool closure models. Uh, Laura Zana has developed closure models for geophysical flows based on Cindy. So it, so it is starting to be applied in other contexts and turbulence as well. Yeah, cool question. Thank you. Um, great. And so there's, uh, oops. Um, <laughs> And there's uh, another question that you talked about uh, stochastic dynamics. Um, there's another question here about what about noisy measurements? And I'll also tack on um, something I was curious about, which is how does the discretization of the data versus the continuous time nature of the dynamics play into the accuracy? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, that, that, that's almost like a whole nother talk about how noise fits in. So, so Cindy, the vanilla standard Cindy is, is somewhat prone to noise. Um, it's sensitive to noise. It needs clean data sampled pretty rapidly. But there are some really simple techniques you can use to make it much more noise robust. Um, one of them is using robust derivatives, like a total variation regularized derivatives. Another one is to put Cindy into an integral or weak formulation using control volumes. This is what Hayden Schaefer and Roman Gregoriev's groups have done. That's really powerful. And then Urban Fazel, a postdoc working with us, has recently used ensemble methods, uh, bagging, bootstrapping, uh, things like that, to massively, massively increase the noise robustness. So short answer is, you know, and those are all built into PyCindy, that open source package. So again, you know, that, that's a problem that's becoming increasingly solved as time goes on, but it, but it is a real problem. Great, thanks so much. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's time and, um... We have, there's a lot more questions in the, in the Q and A and, and the chat. So- um, Awesome, well, I, thank you so much. Yeah, I apologize. I couldn't get to all of them, um, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for, ha for joining us and for the wonderful talk. And um, yeah, let's thank our speaker one more time. All right, um, Rose, I guess you're next. Um, hi, welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, are you able to share your screen? Um, Does it work? Yes, I think so. Can you see the slide? Yes, yes, I can see. Um, so 
Great. So, so uh, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll, uh, we can get some, I can introduce you. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Rose Yu, who is a um, assistant professor at UCSD in computer science and um, <sighs> Gal is going to kill me. I can never pronounce this right. The uh, Hulgu uh, data science. Oh, how do you do? Yeah, it's very difficult. It's a Turkish name. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. So, so uh, um, Dr. Yu is here to tell us about her work. She's been doing some fantastic work in both physics-inspired ML, and as well as uh, I've been uh, fortunate to start seeing um, digging into her work on on tensor models and their connections to. Uh, dynamical data and to uh, other models like GP. So 